I've been interested in John the Baptist for a while now. His ministry is really, really important. Uh, in chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger. He will clear the way before me. Uh, and the Lord whom you seek, the Israelis, the Jews that they were seeking, will suddenly come to his temple. And in chapter 4, starting with verse 1, we hear us. This is a summary of John's ministry. This is his ministry. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and will and all the arrogant and every evil doer will be will be chaff. That means burned up. And the day is coming will and will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves uh, from the stall. In other words, they are free in the morning, and they jump around, you know, you ever seen kittens play? It's like calves, they're like kittens playing. And you will tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet for the day of which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statues and ordinances which I commanded him in or of all, all, for all Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah. And here's our prophecy. The prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the people, literally turn them. Turn them back. So I, the idea is repentance. And the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the land with the curse. Now that curse is the, is the ban or the total destruction, which did occur in 70 AD. There was a curse that brought upon the land. But this prophecy, if you'll turn into the New Testament, into Luke chapter 1, the Bible picks it up in Luke chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, which is, which is really an a interpretation or helps us understand what, this, what Malachi is talking about. Luke 1, 16 and 17. See, again, he's going he's gonna to quote this, but not quite. He will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him, Christ, in the spirit and power of Elijah, to first to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children or with the children. Some say this means that the fathers and the children both are going to turn back to the Lord. And that is the idea. So you got fathers and children turning back to the Lord, which, which, listen, is the renewing of the family system that God set up through the patriarchs, through the Mosaic law. What's happening here is in a degenerate nation, when a nation turns away from God, the first thing to go are the marriages and the families. You see it in our nation in a big way today. The nations begin to, I mean, the families begin to crumble. And so what's happening with John the Baptist, he's coming to, he's going to be sent to a degenerate nation. They've, they're, they're religious. Now, they're not so much the, the lascivious crowd. They're the ascetic crowd, and they're very religious people, but they're degenerate. They steal from widows. The religious people steal the home of a widow. Now, how bad is that? That's pretty bad. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is when John comes, he's going to renew and reinvigorate and reemphasize the family system. One of them, uh, um, a great message for you this year at Christmas is to renew your commitment to your own children. 
to teach them, the emphasize to them not only the importance of the birth of Christ, but the whole Christian life. I mean, this is a time when John was sent to reestablish family connections. Family connections. Now, this is not just human fathers to human children. This is the whole, see, when he says fathers, listen, in Luke 1, 17, he, he will turn back the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. There's the general idea, the sons of Israel. That's fathers and children. And when he says he will turn the hearts of the fathers back with or to the children, these fathers that he's talking about are not only just, just regular the father and the family, but the patriarchs. <clears throat> He's going to reconnect the promises of the patriarchs to the people of Israel because they've lost touch through religion and their code, this code of morals and, and uh, this book they went by, this commentary. Uh, I can't remember. What was that called? Their, the tradition. Yeah, the tradition of the elders that they went by. That had become more valuable to them or more dominant than the Word of God. And they went by it. They lived by it. And if you didn't follow it like Jesus, he ignored it. He cared nothing for it. And they hated him for that because he just, he, he just he realized that it had no value. So he's going to return the people back to the promises of the patriarchs. Because this is what we're dealing with in the Messiah. So he's going to reunite this whole patriarchal family system and reinvigorate it. And that's what ought to be this, this Christmas. I mean, there's a message. There's a Christmas message for you right there. I mean, go get your kids. Go get your kids. Go get them and make sure that they understand. Now, you can't, you can't make them do what you want them to do. Don't you wish you could? <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? But it wouldn't be God's plan. That'd be my plan. Now, so here's a message for us. Turn your hearts to your children. Now, he also says, and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. And here is the idea of the unpersuaded, back to the attitude of a righteous person, and finally, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, Gil is one of the... I, I, there's a website where you can go, and it's got about 20 different commentaries about any passage. It's a pretty neat place to go and read, but... Gil, I thought Gil was interesting. He will turn the heart of the children to their fathers or with their fathers, that is, both fathers and children, the meaning that is that John the Baptist should be an instrument of converting many of the Jews, both fathers and children, and bringing them to the knowledge and faith of the true Messiah and reconcile them together who were divided by the schools, Hillel and Shammah, and by the sects of the Saracies and, Saracies, uh, Sadducees and Pharisees. See, he's talking about bringing together a divided nation, divided by religion, divided by different schools of thought, and bringing them together and uniting them together in front or before Messiah. To bring them to be of one mind, judgment, and faith, and to have a hearty love to one another in the Lord Christ. So that's an interesting way of looking at that passage in this whole concept. Again, the fathers and the children, and we're dealing with the patriarchal and the mosaic system of fathers instructing children in the true knowledge of Messiah. Now, what was John's ministry, his mission? If you notice in Luke chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, are y'all there? Are is that where your Bible is, Luke 1? Notice that it says, 
and he will turn. This word turn, epistrepho, means to, to turn back, to turn around, is the whole idea. It means to return to the worship of the true God, to call somebody to return, to bring them back, to turn them around. So if somebody needs to be turned around, that would indicate that they're going in the wrong direction. Would you, would you agree with that? I was talking to a young lady, Rhonda and I were talking to a young lady yesterday about being bitter about bitterness and taking revenge and how that was a road. If you took that road, where that road would end. And it's not a pretty place. And we tried to explain to this young lady what was involved, and, but it was difficult to communicate because the desire for revenge was, is very strong. And I mean, she's visualizing hurting this person. So she wants to destroy him. But anyway, this is a road that needs that Look, when you find somebody on that road, we did our best to turn her around. See, John's ministry is our ministry. It's our ministry to turn people around. And listen, the road to bitterness is one to turn from. I promise you that. It's one to turn around on. Well, if you're on that road, if you're on the road of bitterness, wow, turn yourself around right now and, and burn rubber going the other way. Burn some rubber going the other way. I promise you that's not a good road. Now, John's ministry was to return the people back to their proper spiritual relationships. Not only to the proper view of Messiah, which we'll talk about in a minute, but their proper view of one another and how they were to be with one another in relation to helping one another, just like we were with this young lady. Helping people turn around. Helping them turn around. I, I didn't grow up in a religious family. Would you get me some water? Uh, there you go. Thank you, sweetheart. Uh, I must have a guilty conscience. I didn't grow up in a religious family. We didn't go to church much. And because of that, one of the ideas I wanted to share with you today, because of that, I didn't have a lot of religion and, and stupid stuff to replace. Religion is stupid stuff. I mean, that's as nice as I can be about it. Uh, so I didn't have a lot of repenting to do about Christianity because I didn't have a lot of ideas, period, about it. Just what I'd heard from different people, and most of that was... I had never really believed any of it, so I was pretty much a blank slate. And I'm grateful for that because I didn't have to do a lot of cleaning out in order to get the right ideas. And John's coming to a people that needed a lot of cleaning out. Just a lot of they needed the they needed a plumber really bad. I mean, they a lot of they needed a rotor rooter job. I mean, holy smokes, they did. They needed to turn back not only to the proper relationship with each other, but to the truth about who Messiah was and what he was there to do. They were all mixed up about it. The descendants and children needed to open their hearts to the patriarchs who were teaching the truth about who Christ was and what he was supposed to do. You see, for the most part, they understood that the Old Testament taught he would come and be a king, but they left out passages like Isaiah 53, that you ought to read that, that talks about the suffering servant, the fact that he would pay 
for the sins, that he would be counted among the uh, transgressors, that he would suffer horribly. And so they couldn't put all that together, but it, it was there for them to do so. And you know how I know that? Because there's a guy named Simeon at the temple who did, who had put it all together, who understood the mission. He understood that it wasn't, his mission was not to be there, come and be the king. So anyway, the nation was apostate, just like ours. They had lost their true understanding of who, would, who Messiah was and his mission. If you would, hold your place here at Luke and turn to Jeremiah 17. And start at verse 5. This describes the nation of Israel, and it describes many, many people that, that we all know, including maybe ourselves. In Jeremiah 17, 5, thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, in whose heart turns away from the Lord. He will be like a bush planted in the desert. This is my favorite part of the verse. He will not know prosperity when it comes. Prosperity will be given, and he won't even know that it's prosperity. Won't even want it. Won't even think that it's something good or important. He'll look at it and go, get away from me. And yet it'll be the blessing of God. Won't know prosperity when it comes, but instead will live in stony wastelands in the wilderness in the land of salt without inhabitant. Contrast, verse 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose strength is the Lord. He will be like a tree planted by the water, extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves will stay green. It will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. In verse 9, the heart is more deceitful than all other things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? He says it like rhetorically, who can know it? Like it's impossible to know, but listen to look at verse 10. Ah, the Lord search the heart, test the mind. He can know it. And I tell you, if you look to him, he'll let you know it. But what you need to see, what I wanted to share with you, is that John has been sent to a people that don't know prosperity when it comes. They don't know what they're looking for. They're all about the earthly and the material. You see, they were looking for a Messiah who would come and remove their earthly challenges. They lived under Rome, Roman rule, and Rome was tough. But Rome was fair, and Rome brought peace. Rome brought security. Rome brought a lot of divine establishment prosperity. But they hated Rome. And there was a lot of reason to hate Rome, but Rome brought good. Rome brought freedom all over the known world for the gospel to go. Had they understood the importance of the gospel, they would have valued Rome. They would have understood that Rome was a tool in the hands of the Lord to open up the boundaries of all the nations, to build roads all over the known world, to provide, to provide uh, protection, police-type protection from bandits and robbers so that people like Paul could go all over the known world with the gospel and be safe. That's what Rome did. And the Jews hated Rome. They wanted Messiah to come and destroy Rome. See, they didn't know prosperity when, they, when it came. Had they been about the gospel, had they been about the mission, the spiritual mission, they would have, hey, they wouldn't have enjoyed being under anybody, but they would have used Rome for what Rome brought. They would have recognized the blessings involved. And they would have 
use what it what Rome brought to the table to promote the spiritual world. But listen, when your whole sense of blessing is material, then you're disoriented anyway. You can't see what God's doing in your life, period. I mean, if it doesn't fit your human, earthly, material agenda, then you think it's bad. So James tried to tell these same people that he says, look, when adversity comes to your life, it's a reason to rejoice because God is working in your life trying to grow you, trying to free you from wrong ideas. So Luke 1, 16, 17, he's, gonna, he's going to prepare a people for the Lord. This nation, this apostate nation, his job is to come and teach a message of repentance. Now, let's look at point one. The true understanding of Messiah's mission as revealed to the patriarchs and prophets had been lost and perverted by, by legalistic interpretations of the Old Testament scriptures. Now, we know there was a proper view of the Old Testament scriptures because of Simeon. In Luke chapter 2, if you're in Luke 1, just go to chapter 2 right quick and look at verse 25, Luke 2, 25. Behold, there's a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, a righteous devout looking for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Listen, do you know why the Holy Spirit was upon him? Because he had asked that the Holy Spirit be upon him. That's something you could do back then. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see, he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ or the Messiah. And he came in spirit, in the spirit to the temple that day, and he saw Jesus, and he went up to them and he took the child and blessed him, and he said, The Lord has, uh, uh, now, Lord, you have allowed your bondservant, allow your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people. See, first of all, he knows it's not just the Jews, it's for all people. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. His father and mother were amazed at the things, and Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed, and a sword shall pierce even your own soul, to the end that the thoughts uh, from many hearts will be revealed. Now, how does he know that a sword's going to pierce her heart? What's he talking about? A sword's going to pierce Mary's heart. Listen, he knows why Messiah's there. He's there to pay for the sins of the world. He knows why he's there. He's read the Bible, all the Bible, with an open heart, and he wasn't looking just to make it fit his agenda. So, Simeon understood Messiah's true mission to suffer for all the people, this is taught in Isaiah 53, which you ought to read today. The nation at large had blocked out the suffering servant passages. Isaiah 53 is a great one. Psalm 22. But they, listen, they, they had blocked it out. They had ignored this part of the revelation because it did not fit with their human agenda. This is the disciples. The, Jesus kept telling the disciples, I've got to go to Jerusalem and, and be mistreated by the religious people there. I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm going to come back to life. Like Jonah. Couldn't hear it. Couldn't see it, couldn't hear it, wouldn't have anything to do with it. They already had an idea that they believed, listen to me now, 
This is, this is the crux of the message. I know it's a little scattered today. I'm, uh, we moved yesterday, and I don't know how I'm standing up here today, but uh, I'm a little tired. But uh, when you already have an existing view about something, and the Lord brings the truth to your life, in order for you to fully ex- make that exchange, you have to reject the old idea. You have to remove it. If you don't, you're going to end up double-minded because you're going to believe the new idea and the old idea as well, and you're going to be back and forth. You're going to be double-minded. And the Jews in Israel didn't even get to the double-minded part yet. They didn't believe the new part yet. They still they held to this old idea of a Messiah as, as an earthly king tenaciously. This nation had blocked out any other idea of the suffering servant. We often see what we want to see in the promises of God because we read our own agenda into them. We read into them. We read into them. Our human earthly agenda is insidious to insinuate itself into God's will. That's what I see in the nation of Israel. They wanted Messiah to come and rescue them from Rome and make them, uh, take them back to the days of David and make them powerful again as a nation in an earthly, material way. Their whole concept was earthly and material. They couldn't see beyond that into the spiritual life. They didn't really understand that the kingdom of God was within. They didn't get that. They thought of the kingdom of God as an earthly, uh, with boundaries and all, as a nation. And rightly so, but they, they refuse to see beyond that into the spiritual. So where are you? Are you able to look beyond the physical blessings, earthly blessings, material blessings of Christmas and see that there's a purpose for it, that God has allowed this to come into our life and be what it is in this day and time to promote a message? Not to, not to receive gifts, earthly gifts. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people refer to the gifts under the tree as Christmas. That's my Christmas. The gifts under the tree, that's my Christmas. Is that you? Is it about the gifts under the tree? It's really about the gifts, the gift on the tree. Hey, I just thought of that. Not the gifts under the tree, it's the gift on the tree. Pretty smart, aren't it? The nation, thirdly, the nation suffering under Roman rule had driven these people to limit Messiah's work to just simply defeating Rome and establishing an earthly kingdom like David's. When we suffer, it's difficult to see the good in it, and we only want relief. It's very difficult to endure and embrace suffering for what it teaches us. We only want relief, and they wanted relief so bad from Rome. The apostate interpretations of the scriptures will limit God's blessing to the material world to the material world. Remember hearing years ago, doctrines taught about reaching maturity and being being given the blessings that God had laid out for you. And all I could imagine were material blessings. I had no idea that a relationship with him and intimacy with him and confidence in his care for me, oh, wow, you're talking about blessings. 
Real blessing is in the relationship. It's the relationship with God. That's the real blessing. But look, you say, I hear that and I know it's true, but I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I still want the material. Look, keep growing. Just keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. Look, God doesn't mind giving you the material. He doesn't mind doing that. He does that. When it's time, when you're ready to use what he gives you in a proper way, he, does, he loves giving to you. He's a wonderful father. He loves doing it. He just did that with Rhonda and I. We, we've been blessed out of our gourd. We've got a little nice place on the lake, Lake Joyce. God has given us. So you're welcome to come out and fish anytime. $10 a head. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Listen, John found a materialistic Israel who had little concept of the spiritual world. Who are we? Who are we? Can you lose America if it meant more people got saved? How about that? Could you lose America if it meant that your children and grandchildren were so spiritually minded that they were giants spiritually rather than just physically free? Freedom, listen, Earthly freedom has a purpose, and it's to promote spiritual freedom. All right. Secondly, John's mission was to raise up a pivot. That's a group of believers, of believers who knew the true messianic mission. Fathers and children disobedient, the unpersuaded, literally, to the attitude of the righteous, and this word idea of being prepared has to do with to build, to make, to pull together a people who were spiritually minded, who would understand Messiah's mission. Listen, John never accomplished fully what I think he was sent to do. I don't know of anybody except Simeon who really understood what Jesus was there to do except the Lord himself. He understood, but nobody else did until he resurrected. I mean, listen, when he died on that cross, they were so dejected and discouraged, they thought that the whole thing was over with. Uh, it's over. When he came back, <laughs> you're talking about calves coming out in the morning, they were skipping like a new day. Thirdly, his message began with the command to repent, the idea of metanoia. That is the, to change their mind. Now, if you're listening on the Internet and you've been taught that the word repent means to feel sorry for something and change the way you feel about it, that's not it at all. The word means literally to change what you think about something, to change what you believe, to change your belief. John had to preach a message of repentance like Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why did they have to repent? And what did that mean? Well, they had formed an idea of who Messiah would be, a political leader, a military leader. I mean, look, he was supposed to show up and look like the rest of them except better. I mean, the high priest thought he's going to show up and be somebody like me, just better. And when he showed up as a carpenter with no belonging, listen, when he died, he only had his own his clothing. 
When he showed up like that, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't go there. They just couldn't go there. They had a preconceived idea. Therefore, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Therefore, they had to change their mind about who Messiah was and what he was there to do. The word metanoia, to change what you believe or think, they needed and had to change their image of Messiah before they could see Jesus as the Messiah. That's why he did the miracles. When we already hold a false view of an issue, we must first reject and remove our present false image or idea and then replace it with the proper view, image, or idea of this particular issue. When you hold a false view of something, for you to arrive at the truth and live out the truth, you must remove the old idea and then replace it with the new idea. If you don't remove the old idea, you come into what's called double-mindedness, where you hold to try to hold to both ideas. One is of the flesh, and it consistently tries to draw you back to the flesh. That's why you must remove that belief. They had, at some point, had to change their mind about this whole image of Messiah as the earthly king. They had to let that go. They had to erase it. Because as long as they held to it, they could not see him for who and what he was. They kept trying to jam him into this image. This, can you imagine the disciples for three years holding to this idea of who Messiah was supposed to be, and yet here's Jesus. I mean, they're like, no wonder the guys were half crazy. They held to one idea, and they kept waiting on him to fulfill it. I mean, can you imagine the, the late-night conversation? I wonder when he's going to go and, and tell the chief priest who he is. I wonder when he's going to take over the government. Wonder when he's going to take over the military. I mean, when is this going to happen? It, it was. It didn't happen, and that's what gave them such a difficult time because they didn't remove their old ideas. The religious who have been indoctrinated with false ideas have a difficult time and a difficult journey rejecting the lies of their life and replacing them with the truth. Every belief, listen, all right, listen to me. This is important. This is so important. There's a lady on the Internet. Steve Chafin got me onto this lady. I can't remember her name, but she's really neat. You'll never know about her because I can't remember her name. But she has proven through MRI studies that every time that you think a thought, it, it, it causes a neuron, a tentacle. Oh, what is that word that I'm looking for? The connections between the neurons. Synapses. Every time you use a thought, a synapse grows. It grows physically. If you hold to an idea... Over and over and over again, the synapses, the physical brain connections and patterns that call, that actually create that idea are very, very intricate and strong. They're hard to break. That's why old habits die hard. It's because it's not only a choice, it's, it's, you have to change your physical brain through choice again and again and again. When you reject an idea that you've held to for a long time, the brain begins to change. And, and this old structure that you've been using to support this idea begins to die off. And the new idea that you're using begins to form in your physical brain. Are you following this? 
This is why changing your mind is so difficult. This is why if you don't understand that you have to take off, as Paul said, old ideas, false ideas, what you end up with is both of them in the brain at the same time. Double-minded. So, old habits die hard requiring that we commit to the destruction of old patterns. We have to commit. Listen, if you don't, if you don't commit to getting rid of your old patterns, you'll, you'll, you'll be plagued with it all of your life. All of your life. We had a man at the house working yesterday, and he, you know, <laughs> I said, are you a drunk? He said, no, I don't drink. I said, were well, you a dope head? He thought for a minute. He said, well, I, I have been in the past. And, uh, I mean, I just wanted to know. Uh, I wasn't wanting to buy any or anything, but uh, uh, he said, I've ha I have to stay away from it completely. He said, I used to have a problem with dope, and I, I have to stay away from from it completely or I'll go back to it. There's an old pattern not fully broken out, not fully erased. And listen, that thing lies dormant in his soul, waiting on him to go through enough hardship that he gives up hope on his present uh, journey and shuts down and goes back to his despair and he'll pick that right back up. Pick it right back up and be a drunk again or a doper again. Now, the nation of Israel was addicted to this idea of Jesus as the earthly king. They could not grasp the whole Jonah thing of belly of the whale, you know, three days in the heart of the earth. They just could not, because they, they had an image that they wouldn't let go of. When we fail to reject and remove an old man belief, it causes the condition of James chapter 1 of being double-minded, allowing the old idea to continue asserting itself in competition with the truth, both fighting for dominance. Both fighting for dominance. Christian life doesn't work like that. God has empowered you through the Spirit to say no to the flesh and to clean out our old ideas and replace them with new man thinking. The people had invested their hearts, their treasure, into a false image, habituated it deeply by imagining it over and over again. They had attached emotions of being rescued of being happy to this image of Christ as the earthly rescuer. So that the Lord had to allow them to crash and burn for them to ever come out of it. And, and Peter is the great example. The Lord said to Peter, tonight you're going to deny me three times. Peter was so attached to his image of himself as loyal and brave. He was so attached to it, he couldn't even hear Jesus tell him that he would, he would be something other than that. He, couldn't, he just couldn't, couldn't do it. And when he did, when he abandoned the Lord and betrayed him, you remember what it says it caused him to do? He went out and wept bitterly. I mean, the Lord gave him the... <laughs> My friend used to train dogs by putting an electrical wire in a hot dog. I mean, they, they trained guard dogs not to eat food given by anybody else. So they would throw a hot dog in there with electrical wire. Believe me, that dog never ate a hot dog again. That was... That was what the Lord did to Peter. So, John was sent to a nation who were 
in love with an idea of Jesus as the Messiah, as an earthly redeemer, <coughs> earthly rescuer, when in fact it was time for him to be a spiritual rescuer. Now, he is still in spiritual rescue mode, and that is the main issue. He, he's also in earthly rescue mode. He doesn't have trouble doing either. But the message of John is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the, mes the message for us this year, for all of our family, is that the kingdom of heaven is here. It's in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful that you allow us to see these things, that you allow us to understand what happened before, that we see where John was sent and to whom and for what reason and what struggles that he had. What was the hurdle? The existing belief of the nation. And the reason it was so difficult because they held to it. I pray, Father, you give us wisdom this year at Christmas about our own beliefs and give us the courage to face ourselves and be willing to give up our old ideas and be willing to share with our family this great life you've given us. I thank you for everything, Father. I love you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.